Hello, I'm Hugh Ross, and we've had the pleasure this past week of having Leslie Wickman here as a visiting scholar. And Leslie, you've been doing some rather wide range contributions. You really are a Renaissance woman, <laughs> an amazing scholar. Uh, but you want to share with us today about the research you've been doing on strategic studies and climate change. That sounds really fascinating. Yeah, you know, um, it's it's kind of interesting. I have been involved in the aerospace industry for many years, and um, and that has overlapped with my time in academia and. Um, my last job that I, I first started in the aerospace world, um, my uh, director knew that I was very interested in environmental stewardship. Mm -hmm. And so when I first started, he said, you know, do you, would you be interested in looking at climate change? Um, you know, from the perspective of the importance to national security and uh, uh, federal resources. Okay. And so the first thing I needed to do was kind of convince myself about the evidence for climate change, which I did um, by looking at ice core data and Milankovitch cycles and uh, various records of what the earth has gone through. And the next thing I did was look at the various impacts from climate change on the entire globe. Mm -hmm. And so in looking at those impacts, they included things like sea level rise, um, uh, warming ocean and air and land temperatures, um, particularly uh, warming of the ocean, which uh, provides more heat energy for uh, violent storms. Mm -hmm. um, and then I looked at the cryosphere melt, so the melting of... Cryosphere refers to... To basically all the frozen ice, ice okay. in our world, <laughs> yeah. right? So, um, and then I kind of looked at the timelines in terms of what kind of impacts would uh, be most important early on, okay? So sea level rise, you know, obviously impacts some low-lying military bases and uh, increased storm surges and things like that. But the thing that really caught my attention was the cryosphere melt, and particularly in the Arctic region. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the the northern hemisphere seems to be uh, warming faster compared to other global region, regions, and the Arctic ice melt has been dramatic over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the Arctic sea ice has melted at a rate of 3.5% per decade for the last 30 years, mm -hmm. which is very alarming. And, and the- uh, That's a reference to the summer ice cap, right? Well, this is, this is year round averaged, mm -hmm. okay? The minimum ice extent that you're referring to, which usually happens in about September each right, year, right. Um, has melted, uh, has decreased even faster. Yes. Yes. And uh, so that's that's alarming from an environmental standpoint, but it's also a huge impact on national security issues because, you know, uh, for decades and, and hundreds of years even um, prior to the modern day, um, that whole region has been more or less frozen solid year round. <laughs> And now to have it opening up and melting at an alarming rate, um, it's opening up a third continental coastline to the North American continent. So the Northwest Passage is now open where it's been closed for a thousand exactly. years. Exactly, yeah. so in the summertime we're getting the Northwest Passage open and we've had ships going through there. The, the traffic is uh, increasing dramatically because of the fact that going through um, uh, the Arctic, as opposed to Panama Canal, cuts thousands of kilometers off the distance and between... And you can send bigger ships. Yes, so. and exactly. And it's it's much shorter um, to go through the Arctic if you're going between Asia and Europe. Right. And so, <clears throat> so you know, and again, if, if, you know, if we need a reminder in terms of geography, uh, right across the Arctic from the North, North, um, North Arctic coast, the North American coastline on the Arctic, are our friends in Russia. And um, so just... So it puts them a little bit closer it, to it us. puts them a little <laughs> bit closer, a little more accessible. So, um, and typically, you know, we've, we haven't paid that much attention to the Arctic region in terms of national security So what you're issues. suggesting is it is now possible to have 20... Uh, nuclear uh, missile subs. Well, I didn't want right to say it explicitly, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, the thought arises. 
uh, you know, that, that they uh, can get 2,000 they, miles closer. Yes, exactly. They could get to the edge of the uh, North American continent, which is a heck of a lot closer to the mainland of the United States. And, uh, and so just, you know, we, we haven't had that coastline that needed patrolling in the past. Um, we haven't needed uh, as much surveillance from space mm -hmm. as we need now, as the activity increases. Um, so there, there are demands on assets. You know, um, uh, typically our communication satellites are in, in geostationary orbits geosynchronous orbits that essentially draw a figure eight around a certain uh, place on the equator and uh, track with the Earth's rotation. But um, those, the coverage for those stops around about 75 degrees north and south. And so it doesn't cover the Arctic region uh, in any kind of a complete sort of way or consistent way. And so we're having to um, think about, you know, new constellations of communication satellites with which, you know, the Starlink program, you know, various different uh, companies now are launching constellations of, of satellites that will cover the entire which globe. Which makes me as a radio astronomer a little concerned because right? how are we going to do our radio astronomy measurements with all these satellites pouring exactly, down exactly. their signals? Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, so there are all kinds of, of things that are going on in the Arctic that are... So I've been <clears throat> actually attending um, Arctic community meetings for the last... Uh, Gosh, I started, I think, somewhere around 2008. And, um, you know, people from all over the world come together and talk about the various concerns that they have um, with navigating the Arctic, um, being able to c communicate from the Arctic, um, and just the simple fact that there's a lot more traffic. And so there. this is going to impact the wildlife that's there. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And the, the, uh, the, indigenous peoples that live in that Arctic region that live off the land and sea, um, their lives are very much impacted by the changing um, uh, uh, landscape. You know, the tundra well, I've is I've actually melting. been reading that there, some of them are rather pleased because now they're saying, hey, we can get goods delivered to us true. by ship <laughs> instead of by air. That's true. And we're not going to have to pay as much for groceries. So. Right. <laughs> there are some upsides, I, I guess you could say. Um, but, you know, by and large, their lifestyles are, are changing dramatically. Right. Right. right, and so there are all kinds of issues with the melting tundra and kind of uh, the uh, less stability of the land, whereas before it was frozen solid. Now, are you concerned that if, say, we get these really huge uh, oil and natural gas tankers running through the Arctic, that this is going to speed up the melting? Well, yeah, I mean, you've got the soot issue, mm -hmm. right? You know, so from the exhaust from the, the ships basically uh, depositing soot on the ice, turning the white ice black, which then of course absorbs more solar radiation right, right. and melts faster. So that's definitely an impact. Another thing that um, is certainly something that we need to consider is the fact that something like 40% of the world's remaining fossil fuel uh, uh, deposits are in the Arctic. And so there, there's already uh, kind of a rush to stake resource claims. And in fact, China um, has staked claims in the Arctic, believe it or not. So, so the way the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea um, dictates uh, uh, sovereign territory is to say you can go offshore as far as your continental shelf goes and then beyond that it's uh, basically the open waters. And so uh, the U.S., Canada, Norway, Russia um, have all staked these territorial claims based on the U.N. Convention on the Law of the Sea right. with the, t the uh, continental shelf. That does shelf. cover a good chunk of it, the Arctic. It does indeed, but you get to the middle and it's what they call the donut hole. The donut hole, right. And so the donut hole in the middle is essentially beyond that um, continental shelf. and. Um, the, but at least for now, that's covered with ice. Yes, but the Chinese have already uh, said that they have as much uh, right to the resources in that donut hole region of the Arctic as anyone else does. And by the interpretation of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, they're correct. Mm -hmm. And so, 
because there's so much fossil fuel in that area, um, it could turn into somewhat of a uh, oil rush in the Arctic. So, so increased activity not only from shipping but also uh, resource exploitation. There's a lot of fishing in that region as well. So it's it you know some people some political um, pundits. Now, are you going to be writing any articles on this for us? Uh Leslie. I haven't been asked to yet, but... Well, based uh, <laughs> on just what I've been hearing, that may be something I might want to suggest to you. Okay. Because I think our, our viewers would really be interested in this. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, we have to wrap up this discussion, but I want to kind of share with them where they can go. Okay, sure. So I'm just going to encourage all of you, uh, go to reasons.org, uh, search under Leslie Wickman, and just see what she's written and the videos she's produced and what's coming up next. Thank you. Thank you.